Welcome back to the program. Quick check on the US market, see how we are tracking their um, trading in this range there. The Dow Jones down about 27 points right now, uh, but we are watching the NASDAQ rising two tenths of a percent, so continuing to outperform. Also watching the oil price, which is extending its losses. It's hovering near $48 a barrel, but analysts say that the slide may not have much further to run. After more than two months of reduced production from OPEC, US producers continue to ramp up production whilst global markets remain oversupplied. Oil fell more than 9% just last week after US inventories hit a new high, whilst the rig count rose for an eighth straight week. Still, though, Goldman Sachs remains confident about commodity prices, maintaining its price forecast to 57.50 for WTI in the second quarter. It says the sell-off was simply triggered at technical levels instead of being driven by the oil fundamentals themselves. Let's bring in Tim Evans from Longleaf Trading Group, who joins us live from the CME in Chicago. Tim, great to see you there, and thank you very much for joining us. Just on that final comment there about the sell-off being triggered by technical levels instead of the oil fundamentals, what do you make of that comment? Uh, I mean, I do think there is clearly a fundamental component that has us where we are, but yeah, by all means... Uh, the velocity of that move was definitely triggered by, you know, key support levels being taken out. I, I was actually, you know, on your program a few weeks ago and, you know, we were talking about, you know, various strategies one could utilize, um, you know, to get involved in the energy space or the crude oil market specifically. You know, and, and what we kind of discussed in detail was being long volatility, because at the end of the day, you know, once either support or resistance was taken out, given the size of the position that was in the market, uh, that most likely would lend a, a, a pretty dynamic move one direction or the other. So based on the developments in the fundamentals, uh, the downside ultimately is what was taken out. And, you know, we got a very uh, aggressive move lower, you know, after those key support levels were violated. Yeah, well, given that huge fall last week, do you think this is the li likely the start of, of a trend even lower, certainly after, you know, months of consolidation we've seen? No, I, I don't think. I mean, I think we, you know, I think we've seen most of that downward move. It just happened very quickly. I mean, if you go back and kind of look in context of where we are versus where we were, you know, the market just is heavily discounting, you know, what it began to price in when it was looking at, you know, what impact the OPEC uh, cut was going to have in terms of the price of oil. So the market is giving a lot of that back, in my view, just simply expressing that, you know, the desired outcome, you know, is not being realized. Just if we talk the fundamentals, because we are seeing this increasing supply in the market with the resurgence of US shale in particular, really threatening OPEC's efforts to reduce this global supply glut. Do you think that OPEC will have to step in and potentially ramp up their production cuts in order to maintain the price of oil, given that we are seeing additional uh, supply into the market? Yeah, I mean, the, the, the whole point of this, Leanne, from the beginning was to, you know, work off the excess global inventories of crude oil. I mean, so far this year, you know, we've added 49.4 uh, million barrels, uh, you know, to supplies. Um, you know, so clearly, you know, what has been what has taken place has not had that again, that desired impact. Um, you know, it's one thing, you know, ultimately something's going to have to happen. Uh, in terms of the supply side in order for that inventory to get worked off. And so far, you know, the OPEC deal is, is not doing that. You know, so a lot of analysts are looking at what impact, um, you know, a, a second deal would have or an extension of the first deal. You know, my view is a little different. I mean, I, you know, obviously, you know, uh, continuing cuts would have some kind of impact in the long run or intermediate term even, you know, but I'm, I'm curious to what likelihood OPEC would would have to even be able to, to, to get that through the second go around. You know, you had to bring in a lot of members with competing interests the first time around. Um, you know, they were able to come together, you know, with a common goal in mind. You know, it's pretty clear that common goal has not been achieved. You know, so I'm a bit doubtful that, you know, OPEC will be able to coalesce that group again uh, for that extension, even if they, you know, even if they decided to seek one. Mm. Interesting. We talk about the supply side a lot. What about the demand side? I mean, is it still strong enough to be able to mop up all of this excess supply? Well, I mean, I think that's the most interesting part of this story. I mean, if you look at the demand numbers, the demand numbers have actually been relatively strong in the U.S. and globally. You know, but it, it, again, we're 
you know, we're in a global market that's just awash with crude oil. And, you know, this story was, it is, and it will continue to be a supply story. You know, demand, you know, d GDP can only increase so quickly and, and, and develop, and even developing nations. You know, so demand is not, uh, you know, a variable in the equation that's not going to be able to change very quickly. You know, so the supply side of the equation is one that can change very quickly. And OPEC did its best to, um, you know, try to have or make an impact on that. They just haven't been successful so far. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um now, OPEC, I believe, is going to be releasing its latest monthly report um, tomorrow, Tuesday, which is going to offer some insights into the, the pace of production cuts. In terms of how you are trading, you mentioned there, you know, offsetting that exposure, uh, you know, of oil volatility. Would you sort of just be waiting on more of this data right now to see how the trend changes with, with supply? Um, I don't. I mean, because really the, the, only, uh, the only thing the market generally was concerned with is whether there would be compliance, you know, whether these OPEC members were, in fact, going to follow through with what they agreed upon. And, you know, by all measures, they've done so. <laughs> you know, so we're not really, you know, looking to see, you know, whether, you know, these, these, uh, uh, the agreement are being followed uh, by each individual nation and making sure the accounting is done to prove that. Um, again, I mean, you know, numbers suggest and show and arguably prove that that's been the case. But, you know, with the in, with U.S. shale ramping up production and offsetting a lot of those cuts from OPEC, you know, the global supplies in the market just haven't moved as they were hoping they would. Um, you know, so I don't think those numbers are actually going to be that impactful. I mean, I, I think uh, the Saudi Arabian oil minister last week's comments, you know, that's in my view really what pushed the market lower along with the, uh, the, the U.S. energy number on Wednesday, you know, and that was expressing the idea that he wasn't quite sure if they were going to be looking for that extension. So I think what the market's going to be trying to figure out, you know, is if OPEC is on board again to try to extend this out, um, you know, so in the long run, we can see the numbers that the market expected to see in the short run that we're currently not. Tim Evans, we'll leave it there. Appreciate your time as always. Thank you. Thank you, Leanne. Tim Evans from Longleaf Trading Group there. Just